and going out the other. All right. Welcome to another uh, installment of Rendezvous with Romance in partnership with Avon Books. I'm Amy. I'm a bookseller at Schuler Books in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and as a lifelong romance reader and enthusiast, it is very exciting to get to talk to some of my favorite authors about their work. Um, just as a reminder, uh, you can always get these books in our stores in both um, Grand Rapids and Okemos and also at our sister store in Nicholas Books in Ann Arbor. Um, you can also go on our websites, nicholasbooks.com, schulerbooks.com. We ship internationally, so check us out, support some indie bookstores and get some books. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce tonight's authors. First of all, we have Vivian Lorette, who is a USA Today bestselling author who transforms copious amounts of tea into words. I wish I could get my tea to do that, but I'm with you on the copious amounts of tea. Uh, she has works including the Wallflower Wedding series, the Rakes of Fallow Hall series, the Seasons Original series, and the current series, which is the Mating Habits of Scoundrels. Um, her new title, which I have right behind me, How to Steal a Scoundrel's Heart. Oh, you got your copy too. Um, in this one, we have a determined debutante who discovers that striking a bargain with a notorious rake might just give her more than she has ever bargained for. Welcome, Vivian. Thank you for being with me tonight. Hi, thank you for having me. Sure, yes. All right, and Joanna Shoup um, has always loved history ever since her first Schoolhouse Rock cartoon viewing. Uh, she has won the Romance Writers of America's prestigious Golden Heart Award for Best Historical. Um, her books appear in numerous yearly best of lists, including Publishers Weekly, The Washington Post, Kirkus Reviews, Kowo, and Book Page. She lives in New Jersey with her two spirited daughters and a dashing husband. Where can I get one of those? Um, in her newest book, The Bride Goes Rogue, which we've got right here. Oh, you've got yours there too. Oh my goodness, so prepared. Uh, this is the third installment in the Fifth Avenue Re Rebels series in which a hard-hearted tycoon and a romantic dreamer navigate an arranged engagement that is destined for disaster. So welcome, Joanna. Thank you for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. This is sure. great. Thanks for doing it. Yes, no, this is, this <laughs> is sort of a dream opportunity for me to get to talk to people every month about romance novels because my coworkers are already sick of me. <laughs> Just going on and on about them. Um, so first off, I've given a little bit of a blurb about your books, but if you would each tell me a little bit more and tell us a little bit more about um, your new release and sort of where it falls in the series and, and whatever you'd like to share with us. So Vivian, why don't you start us off? Okay, um, How to Steal a Scoundrel's Heart is book four in the Mating Habits of Scoundrels series. Um, it began with um, three friends realizing that their, that their friend Prudence had been uh, kicked out of London society by her father because she'd had a kiss at a ball in the garden. And so he disowned her. And um, after we saw the first three books and they were trying to help their friend by writing a book on the uh, marriage habits of the native aristocrat, which turned into the mating habits of scoundrels by the time they were done with their books. Um, now we see Prue having her journey coming back to London to reclaim everything that she lost because along the way, not only did her father disown her, but her stepmother sold all of the inheritance that her mom had left her. And uh, as she's walking literally from Wiltshire to London, um, because there was this terrible person on a stagecoach that uh, was ogling her a little bit too much, um, she decided to walk. And along the way, she meets the hero. And he's... Um, a notorious rake. He always has his um, four month affairs with contracts. He wants everything in writing mm -hmm. and uh, he wants her to be the next one. She declines several times until finally she's left without any other choice. And then in the dark of night, she goes and she knocks on his door and then the story begins. And it's, and it's a delight. And there are, there's dogs involved. So if yes. you like to have an animal in your in your story, there's lots of hijinks with dogs involved. Yes. All right, Joanna, tell us a little bit more about our rogue bride. 
Yeah, so The Bride Goes Rogue is the third uh, book in the Fifth Avenue Rebels series. It takes, uh, it really surrounds four male friends in college um, as sort of the, the tent poles of the series. Um, this book is basically kind of Girls Gone Wild colon Gilded Age edition. I'm, um, <laughs> the whole idea was uh, to really take the society girl and everything that she's believed and take it all away and you know she she sort of has to figure out who she is so it's very much like a coming of age um book for her and basically I was researching and very fortunately stumbled across the fact that there was this very risque ball in Gilded Age New York City that was um nicknamed the French ball and it was a masquerade and it went all night long and it started at the Academy of Music which was like this very you know if you've seen Age of Innocence where they go to the um, theater is the Academy of Music very like prestigious and then it moves to Madison Square Garden and it's like 4,000 5,000 people who get dressed up in costume and it's a complete buck and all I mean it's like just you know, like it starts out kind of tame and as the night goes on, you know, clothes are shed and all sorts of, you know, drunken revelry is happening. And so I knew I had to use that in a book. I mean, that for me, like that was, um, I wrote the book around that event. So like, it was like, I had needed the characters to have a history and then everything falls apart. They both go to this masquerade and they meet a stranger and sexy times ensue and it ends up that you know that's the former fiance so that's sort of the setup of the bride goes rogue and then you know it's really you know Kat's decision to uh live life to the fullest you know she's been waiting on the shelf for a year and she's ready to have some fun so that's kind of the kind of the book she is rightly rightfully annoyed if, if i sat around for a year waiting for someone to make up their mind i think i would <laughs> just toss it all off too of course um so that actually leads well into my first little round of questions um because you both write historical romance different time periods but you obviously have to do quite a bit of research and because you want to be historically accurate within the story. So I, I'm curious, how did you decide each of you to write in the time period that you write in? Well, um, it has to do with sexy times, really. Um, <laughs> there's fewer things to take off <laughs> in my time period. This is true. So we're getting to the point where we're getting, uh, we're, we're putting more layers on um but it's the way the clothes fit just um I don't know I like I like being on the fringes in between the two you know the Regency and the Victorian mm -hmm. and what about you Joanna yeah for me um I'm a historical author that came to the love of history um you know, I have a true, true love of history. And I read Edith Wharton. I didn't read Jane Austen until I was in my late thirties. I mean, I just, I, so for me, you know, I discovered Edith Wharton. I love old New York. My relatives came through Ellis Island. Uh, you know, I just have like this real affinity for um, the late 19th century and the time period. And, and I lived in Chicago for a number of years, which is a great Gilded Age city. Uh -huh. um, so for me, that there is no other time period. There is, that's all there is. <laughs> so how do you balance then the historical accuracy aspect with the sort of artistic freedom of the story that you want to tell? I mean, when, when do you decide what historical accuracy things to sort of set aside to make the story move forward? Um, I know that you often include like an author's note about the ball being a real thing that inspired the story, but you know, when, how do you, how do you determine that um, or, or find that balance between the, the accuracy? Cause I know there's, there's a lot of discourse about historical accuracy in historical romance novels specifically. I don't know why it doesn't happen as much with other 
at least in my experience with other historical novels, um, they seem to be under attack a lot, romance novels for being historically inaccurate. But that hasn't been my experience as someone who also, my dad is a retired history professor and as someone who also is a lover of history, like they're pretty accurate from my limited experience. So I guess, how do you, how do you balance the accuracy with the artistic freedom? Um, I, uh, it's, it's always kind of a balancing act. Um, language wise, especially you want to be true to your own voice, but at the same time, you know, I read plays that were written during the time period mm -hmm. so I can get kind of, um, a feel for how the language felt, but a lot of those things just don't translate onto the page now. And when you're kind of going for a uh, quick and pithy, mm -hmm. um, you really have to do modern language. Um, but you try to throw in enough of the uh, older nuggets to satisfy uh, not only your own yearning for, you know, because I fell in love. I, uh, she read you know, Edith Wharton. I love plays. So I've been reading plays for years. And, and it's just one of those things where you just want to, you want to satisfy your, your readers. You want to satisfy yourself. You want to satisfy you know, all the romance naysayers. <laughs> so it's, it's hard, it's always balancing and you're never gonna make everybody happy ever. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, like you said, I, I get dinged for language in reviews where, you know, people say it just, it sounded too modern, you know, too modern, too modern, too modern. So, but to me, if you wrote it in vernacular and, and sort of the rhythms of, you know, the 19th century, nobody would want to read it. I mean, sure. so it is, it is a balance of, of, you know, um, struggling with uh, giving it historical flavor, but yet appealing to the modern reader. Uh -huh. um, and part of, you know, part of why I think historical romance gets dinged a little bit is because of the lack of, of diversity of, you know, we're not showing enough on the page of, you know, just the world that existed in, in those, you know, the, the multicultural world that existed in those time periods. Um, so that, you know, and that's a fair criticism. And mm -hmm. it's something that I think about when I'm, when I'm writing a novel about how can I show sort of, you know, the, the broader, um, the broader uh, multicultural world of New York, but, um, yeah, so it's a struggle. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, has your research into your particular historical setting taken you down any interesting rabbit holes that you either have always wanted to include certain tidbits in a novel or down a rabbit hole that just was not <laughs> totally, totally off base um, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't fit? Just curious about the research. Uh, it is. I have a hard time when I'm in research to come out of research. Um, I can, I can stay there. I'll just keep reading and you find one little nugget and then you're like, oh goodness, I've got to check the footnote and go to that nugget. And then, and then there's a whole series of books that you want to read. And I just, I often wish that we had um, the downloading capability of the matrix where we could just input all <laughs> the information and, oh. and know everything. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's, that's why a lot of historical authors write historical because we love history. We love the re the research for me is like, I mean, that's the fun part. I mean, yeah. if I didn't have to write, if I could just research it and like have somebody else write it, that would be amazing. Um, so yeah, I mean, the research is really the fun part. Um, and I always, like, I mean, people tell me stuff and it works its way into books and I discover stuff and it works its way into books. I mean, I'm just constantly looking for something that I didn't know that perhaps the readers don't know, something that I can use to surprise them with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then what does the writing process look like if, after you've gathered all the research and you've found your way back out of the research? Um, what does the process look for, like for you when you're crafting a novel? 
well, years ago, I should have bought um, stock in 3M because of all the post-its. I have <laughs> post-its everywhere. I have tried to use other programs that act like post-its, but there's just something about having a pen and a scrap of paper handy that I can stick on something. I have them everywhere. So my writing process, and then I take the sticky notes and I put them in certain orders and then I'm like, no, and then I'll make a note on them in a different color ink with, this is gonna be good for chapter four, or this, is, this needs to happen before the first love scene. And so all of those um, research notes also go into the same sticky note pile where I have the, I have a roll top desk. And so on the roll top that's open, <laughs> I have them in order. And then I have them sometimes uh, linked with uh, scotch tape all the way down to where I have different chapters and make sure you input, uh, like for my last book with uh, the wrong Marquis, all about the zoo and the opening of the, I mean, I read so many books on the opening of the zoo and the animals. And I ended up throwing in a few animals that weren't at the zoo at the time. But I wrote that in an author's note, so <laughs> yeah. let people know. But, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's one of those things where we have to mention that this happened, but um, back to the research question, you know, there were certain tragedies that happened you don't want to mention in your book. Mm -hmm. So it's just mostly post-its, I have to say. That's, I'll just, I'll just end there. <laughs> I use a, um, I don't use post-its. I should though. Now, now you've got me rethinking my stack of post-its. Um, I use Scrivener, which is a, um, an authoring software that's made, you know, software that's made just for authors. And it has a um, research folder. So I can actually, if I'm on a website, I can just drag that website into the research folder. And it saves it as a link. And so I've got this, you know, massive research folder with all these links. And I can just click in as I need to refresh my brain about, or I can scroll. And then it's helpful for when I go, you know, a year later and I'm doing the promo for the book, I can go back to that Scrivener file and I can see all those little research tabs. And then I go, oh yeah, that would be interesting to tell people. That would be interesting to tell people. So it sort of helps, um, both as I'm writing and like later on, but, um, and I love, a, I love a highlighter. I have tons of, of uh, books all around me that I've highlighted incessantly. So, yeah. So we've talked post about, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yep. Post it makes those little flags. I put flags in my books. So sometimes, <laughs> so that it, put, it goes to that page and then I've used a crayon because highlighter usually bleeds for me. So I use a crayon to highlight my books. Sorry, I was just throwing that in. <laughs> yeah. um, so we talked about how you got into the historical time period that you did, but what got you into writing the romance genre specifically? Uh, Jane Ann Krenz, I have to say it's her fault. Okay. <laughs> so she was the very, um, when she was writing under uh, Stephanie James mm -hmm. for uh, Harlequin Silhouette, uh, that was the very first romance novel that I read. And, uh, and then after that, it was uh, Jude Devereaux. Mm -hmm. So she's to blame too. Mm -hmm. So she put me on the historical path. And, uh, and Judith McNaught and mm -hmm. so many fabulous authors. Uh, romance in general, um, I probably need to put a little blame on the love boat. So... I still know the song by heart. <laughs> and when I was in high school, I used to write short stories for my friends and I would give them a celebrity to meet on the love boat. <laughs> so. I love it. <laughs> um, I, um, yeah, like, Vivian, I came through Julie Garwood, Johanna Lindsay, Jude Devereaux, Amanda Quick. I mean, all of those were sort of, you know, I spent every summer at my grandmother's house in Kentucky and she had a massive romance library. She was a huge romance reader until the day she died. Um, and uh, I used to sneak in there and sneak like 
and read those books. Cause I, you know, I was a kid and way too, way too young to probably be reading romance, but I would sneak in there and like read those books. And, um, I, I love them. And so, uh, my mom was, is a huge romance reader and she reads all my stuff. Like as soon as I'm finished with the draft, she's like, I want it, send it to me. Um, so yeah, so I, I come by it really through my, my family. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I started back in, I'll say high school with, um, Avon had the, like the young historical series. I can't even remember what it was called exactly, but like Beverly Jenkins had a couple, Meg Cabot had a couple, like Anna and the Duke, but it was like very, very, it was geared towards young adults, but you know, they had the, the cover with, uh, there was one, someone in an outlaw. So it was like a cowboy something. Uh, I have to look up the series. I haven't thought about those. And so almost like a YA, like a YA. Yeah. Yeah. They, wow, were, how they smart. were geared towards, towards young adult. It was the Ava, Avon true romance, I think is what it was called. Mm. And they only released like 10 titles. But I remember Meg Cabot had some, Beverly Jenkins had some. Uh, who else? The gateway uh, drug. Yeah, and they were all <laughs> just like historical. You know, they had the historical covers. Um, and it was- That's it was, amazing. Um, uh, that, then someone introduced me to Julia Quinn and I went down that hole uh, for a long, long time. Um, I'm still there. Yep. <laughs> I don't want to come out. <laughs> <laughs> people will come into the bookstore and ask you know have you have you heard of the Bridgerton series I'm like listen right I was reading them when they came out so yes let me tell you about the, all of the children in alphabetical order let me tell you about all the spin-off books right yeah. <laughs> um so romance has always been my sort of comfort zone, my safe space. Um, before we went on, I was talking to your publicist a little bit about, you know, this week has been really challenging for a lot of people for a lot of reasons. Um, I was in early education for 15 years. And so I was thinking back to classroom situations and Romance is where I go because I know it's a safe place. It has a happy ending and it's going to be okay. That no matter what comes along to thwart the main characters, it's going to be okay. Um, and that's one of the things I love about romance is that, you know, the, the main conventions are it has that central love story and you know it's going to have a happy ending. But you can do whatever you want with it. So I'm curious um, what what your favorite thing is about writing in the romance genre and maybe what you find to be the most challenging thing to write romance? Um, what my favorite thing? Well, I guess my favorite thing is the happily ever after. I need that as well, you know, even though, even though when I think of a character, my first thought is, is pretty dark. Um, my first thought is, what can I do to them that's going to make their life fall apart? And then I'm like, I can build a story around that. So it's it's rarely the meat cute that first pops into my head. It's it's the you know falling on your knees and uh -huh. you know please come back to me <laughs> that uh -huh. that uh, pops into my head. Um, writing it is. Cathartic, I guess you could say. Writing I'll always, it started out that way for me. You know, I was uh, 11 when I started writing and I was able to just pour everything out that way. I'm an introvert. I don't really leave the house all that often. Um, the people I talk to are usually related to me by blood. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and so I still, I still get everything out on the page. And I like that it has a happily ever after. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I like the sex scenes the best. I mean, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Like that's why I'm in the game. That's why I'm in the romance game. I'm here. I'm here to write steamy scenes. I'm here to read steamy scenes. Give me the steamy scenes. Uh -huh. um, so for me, you know, that's, I mean, I really like, uh, those are my, my favorite. You know, they take longer to write because I think about them 
uh, probably more than I do the rest of the book. So they do take me longer, but um, th that's my favorite part. Um, for me, I write really fast and I, I come from a journalism background. Okay. Um, so I write very succinctly mm -hmm. and I have had to learn to let things breathe because I can tend to this happened and that happened and why, what, where, you know, and I, I want to move at a quick pace, <clears throat> but <clears throat> there are times, excuse me, there are times where that doesn't work and the story needs to breathe and take, and so that over time has been something that I've, I've really had to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had great critique partners that will help me with that, that have helped me with that. So that for me is the challenge just to sort of slow down, give it space, you know, give it time. Yeah. Um, so one thing that was interesting, I read both of your, these new titles sort of back to back last week. Um, and what I discovered is there's an interesting similarity or um, parallel in both of them right at the beginning or near the beginning. Um, they, the male main character is sort of letting go of a, of a mistress relationship and that mistress on her way out calls him heartless. In, in both stories. Um, and then, you know, little do they, they have their plan, they know what they want and what they don't want. Um, and then their world is just turned upside down by this, you know, you know, mystery masquerade lady or, you know, bedraggled woman on the side of the road. Um, and everything just is flipped on its head. Um, so that, that trope is very common, the sort of broody, I know what I want, I don't want, to get married. I've got my life laid out for me. Um, we talked last month um, in our first series, our first of the Rendezvous with Romance, a lot about tropes and, you know, all the different tropes that you can find, particularly in romance novels, although there are tropes in every genre. Um, there are a lot that are very, very well known in romance, um, the broody hero being one of them. So I would like to know what, if you have a trope that tends to like come up a lot in your writing or a tr and or a trope that you've always wanted to write but just haven't ever found the right story for it? Um, I actually had my editor introduce my books at um, Avon KissCon Chicago mm -hmm. as a trope-tastic. <laughs> so I put tropes, however many tropes I can throw in there. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, without even realizing it most of the time. Um, the trope that I am currently writing that I've never written before is a secret baby. Oh. So okay. the next book will be a secret baby book. So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Um, I, uh, because I write in the Gilded Age, you know, tycoons are kind of my jam. So I love, you know, a tycoon that, that sort of is a jerk. He works too hard. Um, I don't think that anybody made a significant amount of money in those days by being nice and by playing fair. So they sort of all have just like this kind of baseline, you know, personality. Um, and Preston definitely, definitely fits into that, you know, and I, um, I love a mistress. Like I love having a mistress in a book. Like I, if I could figure out a way to do it, I would write like a mistress tycoon Rome. I mean, I would just like full on write like a bit. I mean, I, so I like to have sort of that peek into his former romantic life with the mistress um, carry on into the book. It gives you good insight into his personality, like how he treated her and how she, how things ended and, you know, um, how he handles his romantic entanglements, you know, all that is like kind of backstory for the hero, which is always fun to put in. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just, it helps you with character growth too, to see how their, their viewpoint has changed towards right. love when they are the heartless, the heartless one. Um, okay, let's see. So the little game that I have for us this evening is for you to think about your two main characters in your 
recent release. Um, and we're going to try to get to know them without giving away too much of the story that hasn't already been given away. Um, so we're going to find some representations for them. So if you had to represent your main characters with an animal, if they had to be an animal, what animal would best represent your two main characters? I think that my hero, his name is Leo, so I think he would definitely have to be a lion. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Prue would be maybe a bird, maybe like a, like a cockatoo, like a bird with attitude. Yeah, you know, sass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's so funny. This was exactly the answers I was going to kind of give. I mean, uh, Cat calls Preston my king. So, uh -huh. you know, because he is dressed as a king at the, the masquerade. So that becomes her nickname for him. Yep. Um, and she calls him Little Queen. So he calls her Little Queen. So I, I don't, yeah, something lion probably related, cat related. Uh -huh. All right. What about a color or a color palette? What would best represent their personalities? I think he would be like a like a passionate orange color, um, like a flame color, and uh, she'd be white. Mm -hmm. uh, Preston, you know, when the book opens, is kind of dealing with some some grief you know, um, the loss of a friend, he's, I think of him as very gray. I mean, very um, sort of like, he's got a dark, kind of a dark cloud over him. And she's very, she'd be like pastels. I mean, she's very um, romantic and soft and um, loves art. So I would pastels probably. Okay. Um, what about an ice cream flavor? <laughs> Okay, well, Leo's kind of delicious. <laughs> At least I thought so when I was writing him. And my favorite flavor is Hagen dazs chocolate peanut butter. Mm -hmm. So I would probably have him chocolate peanut butter ice cream. And Prue can be whatever That's flavor she wants to be. <laughs> Uh, Preston's kind of dark and bold, like maybe coffee flavored. Oh. Um, and Kat, you know, um, I don't know if anybody knows Jenny's ice cream, but I feel like they make a um, like a lavender ice cream. So I feel like she would be oh, yeah. like, a, like a lavender, like something very kind of soft and dreamy. Yeah. Um, what about an emoji? What emoji would you use to represent them? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, emoji. Well, I guess, is there a lion emoji? Maybe I could just make him a, a lion. I think so. Okay. <laughs> and he's a lion and, uh, oh, she would be a broken heart. Yeah. Yeah. Preston would be that emoji that is the angry face that has the curse, <laughs> the curse words across the mouth. He's just like perpetually angry. Um, and Kat would be probably one of the, the flowers. You okay. know, like the, yeah. Again, artistic. What superpower do you think that they would best embody them or best fit with their uh, personality? Hmm. Um, I think that if Leo had a superpower, it would be to um, incinerate a woman's clothes with his gaze. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the superpower of every romance hero, really? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> um, Preston's superpower is like tenacity is like he is willing to do anything and go as far as he needs to to get the job done like yeah just absolute force of will yeah 
just indestructible. All yeah. right. Um, and if they wrote a book, what book would your main characters write? And it can be a real book that already exists, or it can be a new book, but what, or what genre of book would also work? Hmm. I think, well, are we talking about before or after? That is entirely up to your interpretation. Hmm. I don't know. I kind of like the idea that uh, that Leo might be a hidden poet, mm -hmm. that he might write a book of poetry. He would never tell anyone. He would burn it before he would let anyone know. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that idea. Mm -hmm. And what about Prue? What do you, what I do you think like? I think Prue would. I think Prue would write. A murder and I think she would kill George. <laughs> I think she would kill him very painfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hear that or one of maybe they should work together to write a dog handling manual about oh yes how to train your that's a really good idea. Dog. Yes. All right. Um I feel like Preston in another era would have been like Robert Moses. So like the first thing I thought of was the Caro autobiography of Robert Moses. Like he just would have been, um, I don't know. I don't even know why that, that's probably not a great answer, but that's what came to mind. Like he just mm -hmm. like something that just reshapes, you know, New York city. Um, and, you know, she would be something soft and romantic, like, you know, some, Dickinson poetry or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I'm curious, shifting back to you both, um, what are you currently reading? Either romance or non romance? Everything. Can we say everything? Yes. How about this? <laughs> <laughs> that, one, that one's a good one. I highly recommend it. I've recently right. read it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm grabbing all of the books that I have sort of here at my desk that uh -huh. I'm in the middle of. So yeah. A Caribbean Heiress in Paris, which comes out next week by yeah. Adriana Herrera. And it is fantastic. It's in the Belle Epoque era. Um, and it's fantastic. Uh, Dating Dr. Dill by Nisha mm -hmm. Sharma. Yeah. This is also fantastic. Taming of the Shrew retelling, which was great. Uh, yeah. And this one comes out um, I think it's another month, which is American Royalty by Tracy Livesey, which is like if Beyonce and Prince Harry got together, what would happen? That is this book. It's amazing. Interesting. So that's what I, those are the three that I'm sort of in the middle of. All right. I'm currently in the middle of The Cartographers by Peng Shepard, which is a sort of historical maps public New York Public Library, but with a fantasy element. One of my friends recently read it and said, it's like 10,000 Doors of January by Alexi Harrow, but with like maps in the library. And I thought that's, that's that there's a mystery and there's all sorts of intrigue and lots of characters. It's very, very interesting. And next, next on my list after that is the, the new Alexis Hall, A Lady for a Duke. Yeah, um, has a, that's um, on my list too a trans heroine and yeah. sort of friends reunited after a long time. So that's good. So what is coming up next for both of you? Uh, I have Meg's story, which is the fifth book and Never Seduce a Duke is the title. It is the secret baby book. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's coming next. Uh, for me is book four in the Fifth Avenue Rebel series, which is called The Duke Gets Even. And it is um, Nellie's story and the Duke of Lockwood. So Yay! they've been in all four books. So now it's finally their turn. So. They've been bouncing back and forth for a while. Good. All secrets will be will be revealed. Good, good, good. <laughs> all right. And if uh, folks want to keep in touch with you or follow you, where can they find you on social medias and things? I am on Facebook at Vivian.Lorette. I am on Twitter at VivLorette. I am on Instagram at VivLorette. And I have VivLorette.net and VivLorette.com on 
just the regular internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the interwebs. Interwebs. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm um, Joanna Shoop author on Facebook. Um, I love Instagram. Um, I'm a Joanna Shoop over there and joannashoop.com. Great, great, great. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for joining me tonight for this conversation. It was a delight, as always. Um, thank you. I thank you, also Amy. thank Avon for partnering with us at Schuler Books. We are delighted to be in this ongoing partnership. Next month on June 30, I get to talk with Julianne Long and Megan Frampton. So pretty excited about that and have their books on my list as well. Um, just a reminder, if you are interested in either of these titles, both How to Steal a Scoundrel's Heart and The Bride Goes Rogue are available. Uh, <laughs> Schulerbooks.com, NicholasBooks.com, or in our stores. Again, we do ship internationally, so um, support our local bookstores or support your local bookstore wherever you happen to be. We support all indie locals. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Be well, be safe, take care, um, both of yourself and your loved ones. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>